This is incredible. Uh, and both the fact that we're celebrating um, two wonderful books, uh, Trace by Brenda Cardenas and um, Birds by Beatrice Mkowiak, um, but also that all of you joined us for this. I mean, of course you would, but I just, it's nice to see um, all of you here and out there, hello. Um, uh, my name is Mike Wendt. I'm the programming director here at Woodland Pattern. Uh, on behalf of Woodland Pattern, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and say that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin, sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, all of us here at Woodland Pattern could not be uh, more thrilled to celebrate these uh, two wonderful books um, and these two wonderful humans who <laughs> wrote these books. Um, uh, um, of course, Brenda, who's a, a dear friend of Woodland Pattern for quite a long time, um, and B, who uh, is a friend that we've missed here in Milwaukee. So, so yeah, a gathering of friends and of poetry. Uh, so it's just a lovely occasion. Um, so thanks to you both, of course, for being here. Um, there are books, of course, for sale. Uh, as Brenda would say, when you're, when you're in the presence of great poets, buy their books. So. <laughs> <laughs> So do that, if you haven't already. Um, and then the last thing, you know, you'll hear just very little from me, mercifully. So the last thing, I just want to mention a few things that are coming up. Um, another involving Brenda, uh, Thursday, May 11th at 6 p.m., uh, UWM graduate and advanced undergrad student poets um, from Brenda's creative writing classes will be here reading some fantastic poets. So. Um, that's open to the public, and you should come to that. Um, and I know some of you are the poets also. I see you. Yeah. Um, uh, Saturday, May 13th from 5 to 8 p.m., we'll have a um, reception for this current exhibition. Um, uh, Bruce Meets Adam, work by Adam White Osers, which um, will be up through August or sometime in August. And um, uh, so come for the reception, and then come also sometime when like nobody's here to just take it all in. Um, but just to let you know, next Saturday, um, join us here for that. Um, and then one more Thursday, May 18th at 7 p.m., uh, a reading featuring Kinsale Drake and Chrysosto Apache in partnership with uh, Indigenous Nations Poets. Um, and that is going to be fantastic, so get here for that. Um, so we'll be seeing you, a lot of you in May. I'm um, excited about that. Um, and of course, much more to come, so find us online and, uh, and here in person. But um, ask us what's happening. OK, that's all I have as far as announcements go. So now it's my great pleasure to bring uh, Brenda up. Welcome, Brenda, who's going to introduce Spee. So Brenda, thank you. Wow, I couldn't be happier. Um, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see everybody. Um, and I'm so pleased to be able to introduce B. Beatrice Simkoviak to you. Beatrice Simkoviak is a French-American writer and scholar. She graduated with an MFA in creative writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2017 and earned a PhD in English creative writing from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2022, where I was lucky enough to serve as her professor and advisor. Beatrice's work has appeared in Terrain.org, Portland Review, Omniverse, Southern Humanities Review, and many others. 
She is also the author of the poetry chapbook Red Zone from Finishing Line Press 2018 and the full-length collection that we're celebrating here tonight, Birds, recipient of the 2022 Agha Shahid Ali Prize in Poetry from the University of Utah Press. With the human-caused extinction of at least 469 known species of birds, Beatrice's highly inventive book, Birds, critiques the ecologically ruinous discourses of natural history with its nature-culture divide. With the understanding that J.J. Audubon killed and then contorted the birds he captured in paintings, Bee's lyrical erasure of his Birds of America reveals and ultimately dismantles what she calls an archival cage so birds might escape, their voices becoming enmeshed with our own. In her hands, language is deconstructed and reinvented with such acute attention and care that every word, like another living being, transforms us. The collection serving a vision of interconnectedness that resists at every turn human exploitation of the rest of the natural world. Highly acclaimed Chamorro poet and scholar Craig Santos Perez has said of B's book, quote, read these poems aloud. You will hear the cage of silence slid open and the ardent voices of thousands upon thousands of winged throats will migrate from the horizon. And when they plunge toward you, the earth will tremble with song, end quote. On a personal note, I cannot stress enough how rewarding it was to mentor B during the six years it takes to earn a PhD. Not only did she work as hard as only the very best students I've had in my 34 year career, but she consistently produced brilliant and beautiful work on time. <laughs> as, if, as if she were waving a magic wand. I've never seen the wand, but I can tell you that Beatrice Simkoviak definitely has the magic, and I'm a better human being for knowing her. Being. All right. Thank you to Woodland Pattern to uh, invite me here in Milwaukee. I'm so happy to be in Milwaukee. We went by the lake earlier and to see people I haven't seen uh, in a little while. And also it's, you know, it's where the book started in uh, Brenda's class. Things crazy are happening in that class. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it ends up in a book. So um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, I would like to uh, just thank, uh, especially my wife, who supported me throughout the PhD, throughout the book, Brenda, who accompanied the project all throughout, and to you know people who have uh, given me also feedback and uh, who have entered in conversation with me about the book. So, um, birds. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a collection that needs an introduction. So uh, I will introduce uh, the book if, in, a, in a way by its cover. So the, the, the cover is an Arctic turn. I mean, you, you, know, you, you see the, you know, maybe the, the wings and the, and the, the little uh, claw. Uh, and um, the book, uh, the, so the, the, the book cover, the, the, the Arctitern, is, uh, was drawn by the 19th uh, century naturalist John Jeps Audubon for his famous book, Birds of America. And uh, here I have an excerpt of uh, the Journal of Audubon, the text accompanying the, the drawing. Until that moment, this turn had not been familiar to me. And as I admired its easy and graceful motions, I felt agitated with the desire to possess it. Our guns were accordingly charged with mustard seed shot, and one after another, 
you might have seen the gentle birds come whirling down upon the waters. So yes, as Brenda hinted at it, you know, in our introduction, uh, in his urge to possess nature, Audubon killed uh, the birds he drew. He, uh, to make his sumptuous drawing, he would use ropes and uh, sticks to uh, position the lifeless, lifeless sorry, birds uh, in, uh, in the position he needed them for uh, his drawing. So actually, if you read closely the text accompanying all the drawings, it's a terrible massacre, unfortunately. It's, it's very difficult to read, actually. So this knowledge put in perspective with the, the fact that North America has lost about a third of its birds uh, since 1970s, uh, it's about three billion birds, uh, led me to investigate disconnected approaches to the more than human world. So uh, one of these approach, uh, approaches is natural history, and Audubon was uh, a big figure of natural history, even a revered figure. Well, now it's starting to change. We, we, you, know, you probably have heard about the, the controversy about you know, the name of Audubon used uh, for the Audubon Society. So I wrote birds literally by erasing the text of Birds of America. Shopping at it, I hope to, uh, to uncover the truth behind Audubon's work, but also to enact literally uh, the, the literal erasure of you know, the sky flutter. Uh, I wanted to reveal the ambiguity and complexity of uh, humanity's relationship with the more than human world. And um, you will see through the poem, the we speaking uh, throughout is very ambiguous and complex, unstable, and always on the verge of collapsed. Um, the slashes in the titles and, um, in, and also the slashes severing uh, the poems elicit wings or blades. And finally, I needed the poems to kind of link um, past and present to underline that continuum of you know, disconnect between humanity and the, the modern human world and its repercussion you know, throughout the centuries and in, into our personal lives. So uh, I wrote other poems uh, like ripples. They, they are prompted by lines of the erasure poem and uh, they are made, uh, they are written with my own words. So um, now I'm, um, will invite you in you know that world that world of uh, birds so let's this is a poem i love to start with it's not the first first one but it's kind of uh, it's the first one of the first part around the heavens we moved in silence well-spread wings flapping dusk and low, in search for the beginning of March. We found the rivers, inflicted, elliptical, outer curved outwards towards their factories of belief. We were wishes of elm or holly, abbreviated. We were breeds with clothes resembling a human nail. So the two poems I will read after, I will read them consecutively because it's one of these erasure poem and it's ripple poem. So the first poem, which is an erasure poem, is Viscera. The abandoned sticks of hour cling to close. We wait until farewell the orb devours our lasting. Sunrise, again sunset mingled in plowed earth yields tubercles of rambling dusk. Our hunger obols the graceful notes we feign. Midsummer warble with bluish angle, sing evergreens, ascending solitude. So that's the ripple poem now. Sunset mingled in plowed earth yields. Numbers. A horizon bleeds the sun's played into nebula. 
radio statics spit odd opacities, and the day dies all over our windshield. The plate river valley dwindled into smoldering ponds. Our eyes be cloud over flooded farmlands until fluid leaks from tiny vessels, fields suddenly heave into the air, darken the sky. A million geese migrating across equinox have convened night after lungs collapse and will carry us through to where light mists the last frost. So actually that poem was, uh, it, it was a moment where <laughs> fle fleeing COVID in some ways, you know, all went crazy. So we're like, oh, they're gonna close the state of Wisconsin. We need to take care of Nico's parents. So we packed up everything and, and drove to, uh, to Flagstaff, Northern Arizona and um, arriving, very, it was late, the sun uh, was setting and uh, we were exhausted and like confused. <laughs> and uh, we arrive in the River Platte uh, Valley and s suddenly the, the ground and the sky was filled with geese. It was just like magical. <laughs> and it was actually the day of the equinox. We we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> And maybe we just, I don't know, maybe we imagined it, you know, in our uh, craze. But uh, yeah, that's, that's one of those moments. So, um, the latter part of autumn. Our number, equal to that of the falling leaves of the trees in places raised by imaging taking flight, is falling. Cages swing light and remiss. The ground beneath sinks as nightfall rots in abundance of berries. We cannot conceive a single wing passing over a meadow, plunge headlong towards the earth that trembles. So, uh, the, the, the following poem is uh, a poem in, in which I wanted also to, th that links also natural history and, and uh, uh, Audubon, the work of Audubon and, and other naturalists was very linked also to uh, empires. Uh, many of them were funded by, uh, you know, by those empires and they were uh, sent in North America, in America and, you know, other continent to uh, assess if you want the, the resources, and those resources were also fauna and flora. And uh, an anecdote that is kind of creepy, is like often time Audubon uh, was uh, tasting the birds. So he tested I can't remember, a heron. I mean, like, you know, like birds you would not think of, <laughs> you know, uh, tasting. And, um, and so, that was, you know, they were testing the resources, see if it was, you know, edible and they could maybe raise it in, uh, in Europe. And that's why, you know, in, in, in France, the Jardin d'Acclimatation was to acclimate the species from other continents to the European continent. So, um, so this, this poem is about also uh, colonialism. A complete history. In early autumn, on high sandy hills, on an island on the coast, it was dawn and the fog and the fog. The density of mist, the heavy gales, rocks here and there, over the course from sunrise to sunset. Sur skirting the forests where a fellow fiend, winter rushed forth winter and the lords of hours. Fierce sticks and stacks, once hunger satisfied, it was not. And they prayed, and they prayed. Spring hovering over us, split in their mouth. Trees, streams, and the air gulped. A black dashed orb rolled down high sandy hills. It was night, and the dark, and the dark. Um, I think, yes, I think that those two following poems uh, were written during COVID time, you will understand <laughs> why. Our bodies with wings. 
dive stark mad into the night, the newly fallen muzzled like humbled barbarians. In search of pasture, we found putrid fish, their eyes onaid with ethereal beings. We dreamt, zigzags into sky, loud latitudes, and wildly dove back to, to dusk. Confinement notes. Rusty hinges and blunt clothes grate our small attachments. An ache mouth records cuttings, the salt of sea tells in which driftwood holds time. Shell fragments fill the bottom of cavities. We lie among dead journeys and conjure isthmus to cross silence. On the beach, muddy pools collect, collect evening's coolness until night and mangroves take us one by one, brackish eyes dissolving locks, limbs unraveled in emerald green farewell. Oops. Sorry, my little <laughs> sticker. <laughs> so we are, um, this section is, uh, those two poems that will follow are just about you know the the process of natural history and then how uh, we see other species um, as humanity as humans you know unfortunately a prize a prize a new American fauna these species from open wound with blades these species as long as it sings these species accidentally. This species grass grass against. This species nost nothing better than skin. This species as proof. This species through glass. This species never before, never before. This species scratching earth. This species from wished for land. This species at the approach of night. This species but the next. This species when well cooked. This species from sorrow log, this species specimen, this species of withered reed, this species all creatures, all pleasures, this species from the dried twigs at the extremity of a branch, this species souse, this species as if by magic, this species in a single evening, this species dead sticks. M Marionette is a poem that uh, speaks to um, the process uh, that uh, Audubon used to draw his birds using ro you know ropes and sticks, putting them into you know kind of you know puppeting them <laughs> in a way um, to draw them uh, to look like lifelike. Marionette. The head can rise as if glee could fly out of their throats, as if exceeding departure. When raised, wings decurved from dusk to blossoms, compass migrations displayed as sinew, yonder in a rustling breeze. So this poem is my favorite poem. <laughs> Of the, of the book, um, I, it's just, uh, I think it's just, you know, speak about our time, our time also, you know, with my wife of, you know, uh, of becoming and, and, and cages that, you know, we, we put sometimes around ourselves because it's comfortable and uh, that, you know, sometimes we escape from and, um, so there's always that, you know, balance to find. And uh, so that's for you. Of becoming. An eclipse now roosts beneath our wings. We hear wolves howl and the monosyllables of an axe. 
Trees are felled, then named. We compose clocks with sticks, hang them around our necks. Forget the old elm that would gnarl wood into wishes. Maps peel off from beach logs. We mask with stone legends and act Laure du Bois as a clearing. When fog moans through the forest, a cage is lit to guide our path. We vanish, dear Blossom. Um, this one is uh, one of the ripple poem, but I, I didn't give you the Irish poem that goes with it. So, just, just you know, so that you have an idea of uh, what it what it is by itself. Also, out of their breasts, as if I found a bird skull blooming in an oak grove, like a plague doc doctor's mask. Its beak scented with pinion and juniper. Death is discarnate in the desert. Crows shed dusk, and you collect the fledged shadows that now drapes Mansanita. My fingers brush skeletal trees, fumbling for the flesh of residual rain. I meet you in the penumbra, memory of light from the first point of Eris. So throughout the book, um, th there is also a, a progression towards which there is less and less distinction between, like, the we is always very uh, complex and ambiguous, but it, become, it becomes more and more ambiguous as we go. Um, and so this poem, you know, is, I think, an example of uh, that where you know the poems go, and and I actually throughout the the book, I took ev like the strong markers of birds, I took them out. Um, in the Eurasia poem, there's no beaks, there's no you know, uh, I mean the wings are there because they can be you know like you know the plane and you know we we fly to in some ways, uh, but but all the real, like, very specific markers of birds are, have just, you know, took, I took them out to just, you know, throw confusion. <laughs> Notwithstanding that the fact of our being has big, sorry, it was just the, the one before, is that there? Notwithstanding, oh, you know. Uh, so you will have to hear it without <laughs> seeing it. I, I probably forgot it. <laughs> we were discussing as we were doing the, <laughs> the PowerPoint, so. Notwithstanding that the fact of our being has become undeniable, that they cut the blood near the root, that we cling to reeds neck erect, that they whistle civilities and shift from one hill to another that we remain, that we by a perfect stillness, that twigs elapse and when least expected, the crossing in thousand ways, that, that wings, tongues, sternums, that intermingled we there and steady flickering, that wound and that nothing is none but the heft. Here you go, <laughs> this one. This, uh, this is the one that I love also. To the water that carries them gently. Fill the roof of their mouth with root songs and mosses, but leave their winter dress, a vivid red dress, the seal of broken windows as they enter the river. Collect their sunset and ignite the course towards ourself. Emolition. It's a kind of more elegiac poem, I think. Um, and uh, this poem is actually a, it's a coda, and uh, it is the very last poem of the collection. Uh, maybe as a you know monument to all what we are losing right now. 
the remembrance of thousands. Twig, twig, beloved, a field of quivering clover, and there, perched on a fence stack, adieu, bows and mosses, borders breathe through the night, wings hatch from blades of grass, cleave, another, another, not louder than a love call, perched on a fence stack. Adieu, gentle, as if spring or autumn, the hatchets have mangled the last pine's death, a chattering unsettles, flocks after flocks. Thank you. Brenda asked me to make my intro not too poetic. <laughs> so it's going to be kind of basic and mostly informational. This is Roberto Harrison. Uh, I'm, her, I'm, her, I'm her husband. <laughs> yeah. So my cousin Alberto in Panama, where I'm from, I'm getting to know Brenda while we were visiting there years ago, described her as divina. Divine, Divina Dita, Divine Brendita. That is how my family here in Panama knows her. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I feel so fortunate to be married to Brenda, especially lately I'm reminded of how strongly her star shines. From many, many places, people of all kinds and all great, Brenda is deeply loved. Her poems have had a strong and beautiful impact on the world. In 2015, Maeva Ordaz, a Mexican-American high school student in Alaska, competed with more than 365,000 of her peers to become the national champion of Poetry Out Loud, a poetry recitation competition for high school students. Maeva recited Brenda's poem, Zakwan Papalotos, along with two other poems by other poets to win $20,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts to attend Columbia University in New York City. Also, more recently, and she might play this, I'm not sure. Are you gonna play the? Um, <laughs> composer Daniel Alfonso of California State University wrote a choral score to her poema Para los Tintunteros, which will be published by Hal Leonard, the largest US music publisher. This orchestral version of Brenda's poem will be part of a series of choral works curated by Dr. Eugene Rogers of University of Michigan. Other notable accomplishments are listed on her website. Most importantly, Brenda is a strong and loving pillar of our family, of our community, of Milwaukee, and of the region. She is finally retiring next year and is leaving behind a legacy of having taught many now very accomplished younger poets who write in many different ways, including B. She is deeply loved and admired by her students. Ura Yuan Noel writes that, traces a triumph of poetry as a liminal practice that works against invisibility and facile legibility at the threshold of the self for a new consciousness is possible. Brenda's poems move beyond category. They bring a healthy humor to our lives. They express our limits with compassion and love and release. They transmute difficulty into joy and knowledge and intensity of feeling, and they bring us together with a warm embrace beyond our screen-mediated lives. Please welcome my beautiful wife, Brenda Cardenas. <laughs> It always helps to have a husband who's a poet. <laughs> oh, I love you too, Ro. Um, okay, so uh, I am going to start with, um, I, some of this book, this book is kind of all over the place. It's not the project that B's book is, but it has certain things that are happening in it. And, and one of them is a number of ekphrastic poems poems written in conversation with visual art. So I'm going to start with um, a couple of those, 
And the first one, we, I have some slides of the, the visual art so you can see. Um, this is Ana Mendieta, a, an artist with whom I'm obsessed. Um, she, um, was, she was sent from Cuba during Operation Peter Pan to the United States, which was when, during the Cuban Revolution, parents in Cuba who were so worried that, of having their children grow up under Fidel Castro, there was an operation where they were sent to the United States, but without the parents, so they were separated from the parents. And for some children, that worked out well. For others, it didn't. And for Ana Mendieta, she was, went from foster care home to foster care home, and it was a really hard road for her. Um, and she ended up um, finally going to art school and becoming an artist, and she did, her work is very ephemeral. And I have a love affair with ephemeral works, earthworks, I call them, or earth body works. So she either put her body into nature uh, or she carved or laid things on, on the sand beach where the um, water would eventually you know, lap it away. This would eventually erode. Um, and so I have several poems um, in here on Anna's work. Um, this is one of them. And um, it's called Our Lady of Sorrows. At, at a point during the poem, um, they'll switch the slides so you can see the poem itself because the second half of it is an erasure of the first half. Our Lady of Sorrows has appeared to the mountain dwellers, her grief engraved where stone softens to clay. Keep your eye sharp for a dagger. In its hilt, you'll find her face pressed to the earth's cheek. Kiss this sacred spot before the rains wash it away like her orphaned feet. Notched heart cradles a planet heavy with nightmares flying into empty mouths. Listen for their thirsty murmurs. She'll push her ponderous child into the dew of a San Felipe dawn, name him Salvador. They'll rest beneath a web spun umbilical, eclipsed from our human eyes. Our Lady, stone, clay, earth, rain, orphaned, heart, eclipsed. And the next poem is also an ekphrastic poem. And I've, I have about three or four in this book that are um, written in conversation with the artist Eric Ricardo de Luna Genel, who created his own Loteria deck, Loteria being the game that's so popular in, in Mexican and Mexican-American households. It's a lot like bingo, only instead of there being numbers on the cards, there's little drawings on the cards. And so there'll be a tree, and it'll say el arbol, and then there'll be a, you know, whatever, a, a ball, and it'll be la pelota. Um, and he did a deck, a loteria deck, that are all um, um, drawings of death, death in different manifestations, um, and it's, that means 100 names for death. And this is La Hilacha, the Loose Thread. And this poem is in memory of Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his daughter Valeria. Oh, one more thing I have to tell you. Ixchel, I mentioned Ixchel, and Ixchel is um, the, in Mayan cosmology, Ixchel is the goddess of the moon, of water, of weaving, and of childbirth who set the world in motion. In her darker aspects, she's depicted as a crone wearing a skirt with crossed bones and carrying a serpent and a jug of water. From that jug, jug, she would pour rainstorms and floods onto the land to destroy, cleanse, and prepare for rebirth. So um, that's who Ixchel is. Ixchel, skeleton moon at her loom, wipes her furrowed forehead, daddy long legs dangling like loose threads from the corners of her eyes dark as ditches. She stitches crossbones into skirts, weaves skulls into blankets she will trade with travelers, mantillas, rebosos, she'll sing, unfurling her wares for parents to wrap around babes she has guided from their mother's oceans to earth. Under one moon, a Salvadoran father and mother cannot wait any longer in the winding lines of starved asylum seekers ordered to halt. 
so their daughter, not yet two, wraps her tiny arms around the bow of Poppy's neck, clings to his trunk as he wades into the big river, swims strong as salmon against churning currents. But when he spills her on the bank, warns her to wait, and lunges back into the torrent for mommy, the little one panics, follows. Under one sun, the river carries them away, defying the border it never meant to become. Ekshel's waning crescent finds them first, face down in the mud, wrapped together in the black shroud of Poppy's shirt, and from her great jug, holding all the waters of heaven, she spills storms to wash away the lines we've carved, dug, drilled, the walls we've built in chain-linked barbed wire, concrete and steel, between desert and desert, river and river, earth and earth, between father and mother, mother and child under one moon. So I, I wrote that after that photograph appeared, you may have seen in the newspaper of these Salvadoran migrants, and they, they died, and they showed the picture of the um, child on the father's chest. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna bring it up a little bit here. I don't wanna have people walking out of here like, whoa, that was gloomy. Okay, so um, <laughs> this one, this poem is called On the Coast in Pedasi. Pedasi is a, a, a little town in Panama in the interior, um, and it's on the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, and Roberto and I visited there and had a, a kind of a magic real, real moment. On the coast in Pedasi, beach boats litter coves, sails sprawled like abandoned skirts of lovers asleep on the sand. The empty zocalo simmers, a secret waiting to be whispered. Cafe Tiesto shutters and doors anchored open to release its brick oven heat. Through a streaked windshield, you watch a woman sweep the dusty veranda. Wipe tables spruced with buds drooping into an afternoon still as a breath held. If you exhale now, a tornado of bees will careen around the corner, swarm the plaza, blackening its sky. The woman will drift inside Gently latch shutters as the funnel cloud drones through town, busy with the work of finding home. Once the horizon has swallowed all of them, you will part your lips, release the locks, exit cover. Watch your step. Every migration bears its fallen, those that drop to the dirt. Across the plaza, the woman will push the door open hum as she sweeps. So we really did see this giant cloud of bees just <laughs> right through the plaza, right through the town. And it was really beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna just read a couple more that mix the Spanish and the English, and then, then most of them will be English. Um, this next one, Placa, where are you, Placa? Um, is an, another ekphrastic poem, and this one um, was written after this piece, uh, Chaz Bojorquez's Graffiti Art, and as you can see, the graffiti is quite glyphic looking, and that's one of the things that drew me to it. Also, the other thing that drew me to it was something that the artist said, and that was, if the city was a body, graffiti would tell us where it hurts. <laughs> And this block would shout, nos diste un chingazo, cabron. Mira esta cara rota, these baton cracked ribs, this black and blue street dizzy con gente. Blades, Kiki, Larry, Snow, Enrique, Connie, Elton King, David Kelly, Jeff Raton, Chaz. Los de aquí, los de abajo. This roll call won't be silenced. Not by Glock, not by chokehold. This, our temple of runes, our tomb, its glyphic curve and flow. Calligraphic code writ acrylic. This, our relic, our scroll unrolled in catacombs, our flex of subtext still buzzing después de que vayamos con la pelona. Que lucha, loco. Ven, baile con nos, baila con nosotros to the aerosols, maraca y hiss. 
Al punk en español's furious sweat hang your head out the window y dale un grito tan llena de duende that it cracks the pavement, summons our dead to dinner, turn the tonal kaleidoscope, then pause. Catch your breath so you don't miss the illegible moment where all the mystery lives. There, decipher that. <laughs> That's my sassy self. <laughs> and the last, um, the last of the um, ekphrastic poems, uh, where is it? I should have written, oh, here it is. Yeah, okay. This is another one from um, that same series. And you can see here, death is depicted as a marathon runner, a racer. Um, and um, I also had, um, there's a lot of elegy in this book because in 2018, 2019, my family went through a series of deaths. We lost four people in that um, three years and, and one, or that year, not three years, that year and a half. And one of them was my youngest brother, um, Daniel. And so this poem is for Daniel. Brother, your heart was a speed metal drummer in a breakaway, jamming for the finish. They had to trip it, stop it, start it, shock it till it threw you to your knees. And La Zapatona, sure-footed in her winged sneakers, tucked phalanges into fists and bolted. Ponytail sailing in her wake, piano grin full of keys hammering sweeps. She shot you that mal de ojo, all black holes, and you still smell her sweat, her stale breath. Feel its fire in your lungs. I cheated her three times, you say. Now she sprints inside my chest. Now she's neck and neck. And um, then the next um, poem is also... Um, for my brother, and it's just called Brother, for Daniel, and it begins with a line by the poet Robin Riegler. My pain is a cloud that might be saying goodbye. It waves its plump little hand and sails into blue. I imagine a fist pump and wink, mischievous smirk to rival your chessire grin. It took a year before I began to wake without memory of missing your last words because by the time I arrived, they had all flown north in search of a cool lake breeze rustling between aspens. The loons Yorona wail, ghosting midnight's misty waves, knotty pine walls of the tiny room where we slept three to a bed, comforted, by dim yellow light shining through cracks and by sounds of our parents, grandparents drinking beer and slapping cards down on the oilcloth just outside the drawn curtain we pretended was a door. <laughs> so yeah, that's for Danny. Okay, and then, uh, I don't know why I didn't write the page numbers down. Um, okay, this is called Bucket's Full. When I was a child, I had a rusty bucket full of ochre wonder, of mustard seed and yarrow, jasper stone and finch feather, of butterscotch and hopscotch, botched tongues and dizzy syntax. Bullies dumped it all over the sidewalk, their pimpled hiccups echoing under overpasses while pigeons pecked at the granular wreckage and the finch feather flew south in search of its bird. Others stuffed my bucket with snarls and suffocating toadlets, ravenous revulsion and arrogant sermons. One held a bucket full of Jesus to the sky and the buckets multiplied. I snuck away with the ugly bucket. Scratched by stars, dented by clouds, the lonely one ready to carry friends like shells and seeds, water and bone, caterpillars, ladybugs, mud and stone. <laughs> and this one, my family who's here will totally recognize this story. So um, let me find it. Oh, I'm so sorry that I did this. Page numbers, Brenda. Table of contents, Brenda. Uh, uh, <laughs> Where are you, poem? Okay, page 71. Okay, um, this one, the, the slides, um, the, this poem is about, I mean, in part, right? It, it's about a, a number of things. 
but it references a dollhouse from the 1940s and 50s, and I just wanted you to see that this is what they looked like. And there's also a slide of the furniture. Okay, <laughs> so those are those, those dollhouses. Underwater. We didn't anticipate rust. How it could climb walls, eat eaves, chew holes in the roof that blistering July, we submerged mom's vintage tin colonial, flooding its retro rooms. 40s suburbia sinking like a submarine to the bottom of our plastic pool. We never imagined splotches of red-orange dust would splash like an action painting above the mantle, drip down the lithographed curtains. Ours was the era of hula hoops, Ouija boards, and twisting limbs across a mat of giant polka dots. After shows like Lost in Space and Hello Down There, we played Underwater Sea Family. Pink crib and playpen floated about the nursery while plastic parents swam from room to room trying to catch their hobbling toddlers. They're bobbling toddlers. Then the mom drifted downstairs to load her ringer washing machine. Dad to the John, always overflowing. Neighbors thought nothing of diving through open windows to deliver seaweed pie or return the baby brother whose lullaby had carried him off in the current when we were busy holding down the refrigerator stove and six kitchen chairs. Underwater sea kids would never have to dry dishes or scrub behind their ears. No dusting, sweeping, mopping, paradise in two and a half feet of water, way down below the ocean, where I want to be, she may be. Even decided to use our goldfish for the family pet, but when chlorine killed Fido, we settled for a rubber barracuda. The proportions weren't right, sort of like the Flintstones with a dinosaur for a dog, but the ocean made monstrous claims anyway. Prehistoric hagfish, mermaids, selkies, who knew what might be possible? In November, when the first snow fell and mom stormed the garage for a shovel, she found her cold water childhood cracked and leaning like a Mississippi shack in the corner, ruined. In the gloom of all our soggy faces, who knew we'd grow up to live in a whole neighborhood of underwater houses? That cr crustaceous sea people would emerge from the waves with their fins tucked in and walk away as if occupying land for the first time. So that, of course, references the housing, you know, when all the foreclosures were happening and the under, you know, everything going underwater. And this poem... is for my cousin, Renee, who's here. One of my favorite people in the world. Um, <laughs> and there is nobody in this world that can make me laugh like she can. <laughs> yeah, laughing with you for Renee. Laughing with you is like riding a tilt-a-whirl, stomach clenched, arms wide open, like an infinite tickle, no stops, train spewing tracks in its wake, losing its caboose. It's like the best flying dreams when you swish into canyons, soar over peaks, like being shot right out of a cannon straight up to the moon, like hanging a star from its crescent tip. Laughing with you turns me into trapeze artist, contortionist, upside down, inside out, racked with sweet pain, sweat, snot, tears. It picks all the locks, breaks the chains, opens every window, bursts the whole bottle of bubbles. Laughing with you is being lost right here, right now, and not needing to find a way home. Yeah, that's what it is. And yes, you can use the word snot in a poem. Okay. Uh, this is called Vexed. I'm so fat with stress that I can't fit under the umbrella. When it rains, my incredible hulk squeaks, soaked, but mammoth breasts keep my feet dry. Drops rolling off my back flood the garden, drowning all my flowers. Pink cheeks are overblown balloons about to pop. In red, I am a forest fire raising all the tiny towns at my hem. 
in turquoise, the Caribbean Sea stretching from Colombia to Cuba, Mexico to Venezuela, I will wash away continents with one swish of my seafoam scarf when I wear brown sequoia forest, mighty river of clay. But most days, the taut whip keeps me plodding, ox with nose yoked to the mud, lumbering down the rows. I sleep standing up, pushing hooved dents in the floor of my stall. Even in dreams, I pull the plow. Um, okay, and this one, Nicole made me read. Um, this one, yeah, this one is a little traumatizing, so beware. This is called Sandbaggers Knockdown. Mm. And this happened in Wisconsin on July 12th, 2013. Only to perch on sun-soaked logs, to migrate or nest, will a snapping turtle leave water. Only for eggs that evolved 40 million years ago will she plod through the rough, drag her dinosaur tail and wrinkled chins across fairways to the open sand trap where the hackers tee off. Shaladra Serpentina's tiger-striped eyes can see straight above her, watch the five iron lunge at her head before cracking chinks, busting bloody holes in her carapace. Still, she will not budge. This olive-skinned mother whose ancestor survived a six-mile-wide meteorite blitz, its nuclear winter, the end of an age. This elder whose forebear faced the great flood and offered the world her back, bludgeoned to death in a Wisconsin bunker. The cold-blooded creature had blocked the man's chip shot, his chance at birdie, bragging rights, and a round of high life for the losers at the bar. I hate golf. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> and this one is for my husband. <laughs> and to redeem the poor turtle that they beat to death, <sighs> my husband, um, I watched him scale a huge wall to save a hummingbird that was um, in a window and didn't know it was a window and couldn't get out. Um, this is called thin air. Trapped by a bend in the basilica, a bird hums inside at the hummingbird outside, glass trilling against its frenzied whir. A man I'll never stop loving climbs the wall, hovers on a sill stretching to grasp at anxious reflections. How many heartbeats to escape inside the outside of joy? To turn a green wing toward his dark palm, closing off light. Lightly palms globe the terror song. Carry it to a garden like a sacred stone. On a holy hill that keeps our crutches, fingers unfurl in a lemniscate of wings. Hmm. And Renee remembers that because we came over going, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> Roberto saved a hummingbird. <laughs> and we discovered at that time this crazy, um, there's these hummingbird bees? Yeah. Moths. Oh, okay. Yeah. We had never seen them before. And all of a sudden, he saved, it was, it was wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Renee has tons of them. She must laugh them in there. OK. Um, just a couple more. Uh, Poems, this um, is called Keys, and this is in honor of my aunt and uncle, who were two of the people we lost that, that year, that horrible year, um, and um, they left Roberto and I their house. Keys. My uncle and aunt left me two hands full of keys, some to lost padlocks, some so worn they no longer turn in locks that block me. One might let me into his mother's tavern or childhood farmhouse in the old country. Another to a diary describing the scorching desert her parents crossed to this land of maples and pines. A few keys kept safe her treasures not worth a dime. Plastic purses, ring with a blue glass stone, 
christening flowers once pinned to the white dress her brother wore 42 years before he burned black beneath a Pontiac set aflame by the drunk who hit him in a perfect perpendicular. Letters written in her husband's mother tongue that no one left here can speak. Skeleton key for the cedar closet opens to three generations of handmade dresses, skirts, suits, tight in their plastic sheaths. And at the very back, her tiny wedding dress, pearls tinted gray like her hair on the pillow the night I couldn't find the key to her breath. I remember the strands as silver streaks across a white sky, keys to a door none of the living can enter. And then I'm gonna end with some funny stuff. Um, I have, the, the last section of this book is, um, is all, poems that are all made from dreams, and I, from, uh, a lot of them have to do with middle age and aging, right? And um, there is this character called Husband who floats throughout them, and he never gets a name. He never gets an article. He's just Husband, OK? But I love him, OK? Middle-aged dreams. So that old lover, the one I didn't remember when I ran into him at a book fair 10 years after we ate strawberries off each other's skin in a steamy tent erected on the sandy bank of a river, the one who approached me all smiles as if we had eaten those strawberries yesterday while I cast blank eyes because I thought he might be the long lost friend I had dropped acid with in a house where fish swam around fork and spoon dipped in and out of coffee cups because, you know, all aquariums are tables set for breakfast. <laughs> Not that one! but the one who left me driveling in puddles while he drifted across country to join a Buddhist monastery. Yes, that old lover shows up at 4 a.m. I've already married him twice, the second wedding only months before, and now he's leaving me again. I'm standing in a puddle that floods the valley. No, the truck route, screw all this pastoral shit and admit it, you live on a truck route. <laughs> about, to about to marry a man I've never seen in my life, nor whose fruit I'd ever want to lick. When I try to shake out the cobwebs and dry my feet on fresh sheets, I tell husband about it. But all he can say is, where was I? <laughs> You mean I wasn't even present on the truck route? <laughs> and the dog purr growls, which means she must go out. <laughs> Subtraction and addition. A night minus husband equals deep sleep, where you dream about husband doing things he would never do, leave you in a corner so he can party with celebrities on a barge out to sea. Meanwhile, you've accumulated a third brother who is aware of your and his departed sibling, but won't utter aloud that family minus brother equals hole in the bottom of the ship. He laughs when you ask him to paddle you to husband, who holds a glass of bourbon up to the moon and howls while spinning like Michael Jackson, something husband would never do. You minus words equals empty space equals panic, stuck screen, gunked vocal cords. Yes, a woman can shoot blanks, turn into a red balloon that loudly farts its way into a thicket of shame. Why you mute bubble? You've always been smitten with the mutable. Clownfish, chameleon, seahorse, selkie, ice cube. You should be the trumpeter that calls them all home. And yes, you can use fart in a poem. <laughs> And I'm ending, this is my last poem. And a lot of you are, I wanna thank that I have so many students here, so many friends, family. Um, you're beautiful, and the students who hear me read this all the time, I'm sorry you have to hear it again. Um, but it's one of my favorites. This is called Shipping and Receiving. Sick of fumbling with lunch sack, purse, umbrella, mask, keys, and the two-ton backpack overflowing with unread essays, laptop discussion posts, poems ca caught in the jammed zipper, I slam it all down on the kitchen table and declare to the dog that I quit. <laughs> I will never again work anywhere that sends me home to work even harder all weekend long. End of story, period, punto ya. <laughs> I decide to shift careers, going to shipping and receiving, 
When I find my feet in thick-soled boots on a cement floor, pencil behind my ear, clipboard in hand, colossal rolls of packing tape, and boxes large as coffins, small as keys. When I raise my hand above my head, semi-trucks turn on their engines, roll into formation. My clipboard clamps one end of a scroll that dra drops past my feet, trails me around the warehouse like a tail. And so I ship. Every essay current and future students will write, paper clips caught in their corners to a grading factory in Antarctica where workers are hungry for words. My email and all social media accounts with their humble bragging to the ether from whence they came. Parking tickets, alarm clocks, blue light and dry eye, long lines and loud commercials to the island of irritation. Foothills of snow at every crosswalk to Tampa, Dallas, and Orange County, specially packaged with a dozen stalactite icicles to hang from their metal awnings. <laughs> light pollution to the darkest corners of hell. Air pollution back to the factories that produced it, estimated arrival well after third shift has bust home. Our mothers are arthritic knees, swollen ankles, and bulging discs on shooting stars to Pluto, where pain's roots shrivel in the dark, never to bud. I send cancer to its crabby constellation where cells heal in each other's light, politicians to the world's largest library where books finally shut their fat mouths. <laughs> Macroaggressions, microaggressions, all our isms I zap back two million years so we can choose to evolve without them. Stop and frisk, billy clubs, choke holes, bullet holes, knees on necks, to a police state that lives only in our history books. Hunger to pastures turned gardens, row upon row of corn, beans, squash, carrots, potatoes, onions, tomatoes, lettuce. Let there be lettuce. Special delivery, the right wing to Alcatraz, where they must read and recite critical race theory while bowing to unions who've rescued them from 12-hour shifts. All pandemics and their anti-vaxxers on an Elon Musk spaceship to a distant zombie galaxy about to be devoured by its starved cannibal neighbor. <laughs> the itch I cannot reach to breeding mosquitoes so they can tear open red bumps in the middles of their own backs. <laughs> I consider shipping the mosquitoes as well. But then remember dragonflies, bats, birds, fish, frogs, turtles, and instead, order a crate of calamine lotion. This I will receive, along with a black and white dog named Maya and the human I love who walks her in healthy forests awash with birds, bear, fox, deer, berries, moss, and mushroom spores. A comfortable bed, books, blankets for all. Students who whisper their poems in my ears. A cup of cinnamon tea, a mug of Belgian beer. Butternut squash, sage, basil, ajo, clove, canela, cominos, tamales, tomate, sopa de tortilla, sopa de papa, many pachangas, muchos mariachis, every instrument and its music, tiny sculptures blown together by wind, fresh water, endangered languages and species in multiple shipments. All those killed for their color, their culture, religion, poverty, for the one they love, the 81 women murdered by men in 28 days, all of them alive again. Con mis tías y tíos, abuelos y primos, mi papá y hermanito, a flatbed full of sempasuchil to light their way. Visits from ancestors, visits from stars. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. We have refreshments. <laughs> it's, it's hot in here, right? We have, um, thank you for coming, thank you for listening, and there is beer, there is wine, there is um, the fizzy waters, um, there is food. Um, please um, go to the front of the store, have some snacks, have some drinks, mingle, okay? Thank you. Love you, Woodland Pattern. Love, love, love you. <laughs>